jump in motocross news. Hello and welcome to another GateTrip.com podcast. I'm Jonathan McCready. Joining me is Andy McKinstry and we're going to talk about Lommel. What a GP that was, Andy. What are your thoughts on pretty remarkable Grand Prix? Wow, wow, wow. What a day's re- oh, what a weekend racing at that track. And my goodness, I wasn't even riding and I'm tired just watching the bumps at that track. It's just, I mean, Lommel's always rough, but even for Lommel's levels, that was incredibly gnarly. Unbelievable stuff and so much to talk about. Really, really good. Yeah, first of all, the track, as you mentioned, it's, it's always good, but I think it was really good this year. They didn't level it. They've leveled most of the track so far this season between the Saturday and the Sunday, and they didn't completely level it this weekend. So whenever they came out, out for practice, it was already the, really rough. The bumps were already challenging for, for the riders just in qualifying, and it, it continued throughout the day. Now, they did do a bit of leveling on the jumps and stuff, which was good because with those ruts, it can get pretty pretty gnarly but just to see the riders navigate that track even even if a race isn't exciting it's always good to watch Lommel just for that especially the the sand guys the Dutch riders look at the wolf for hurlings there just the way the manual over the bumps they're jumping bumps and their their body language on the bike so fluid they're they're skipping the half the track really it's, it's a timing thing really throughout the whole the whole track is very 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 impressive and even the likes of Geyser and Fevre, who will talk about the way that they've progressed in the sand, but you can see some of the riders that just don't have those sand skills of the elite elite Dutch riders or a Caroli. And once they lose their rhythm, it looks pretty incredibly difficult to, to get around the track. And even even the leaders, the guys that are winning, are generally exhausted when they when they come in. It's a it's obviously the, the toughest track on a GP calendar, but it's 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 great to watch. It mightn't be so great great to ride in but it's definitely one of the the highlights for me on the gp calendar yeah the one thing i really enjoy watching the the elite sand guys do is the way that they lift the front wheel up over the bumps and then let the suspension and the on the rear of the bike do all the work really and oh it's not easy to do that every single lap and and over every single bump but the way they do it's unbelievable i mean for the last two motos it was just survival out there for most of the riders but especially in MX2, to see the way Kaido Wolf and Yago Gertz were pushing, I mean, to finish a minute ahead of third was just incredible. This pace them boys were running on that gnarly rough track was just unbelievable. And MXGP was much the same, but the, the depth and, you know, and in, in GPs, the days where there's maybe only five or six guys can ride sand, they're well and truly over. So many guys can ride sand now because they pace themselves there over the winter and, Oh, it's just stacked and it's it's incredible to watch him really ride such a ridiculously brutal track on rail. Yeah, and as you were saying, one minute they're left in the front wheel, but then sometimes they're forcing the back wheel onto the ground to get traction or to get into a bump in order to, to leap over another bump that the timing required. It's almost like ballet in a war zone. It's it's almost a contrast of what the track is to how they ride it. It's, it's pretty unbelievable. Right, we'll get we'll get started on the racing here. First of all, where should we start? Jimmy Cloche, 33rd place. I'm joking. Jeffrey Herlings. That was absolutely <laughs> beyond words, but because this is a podcast, we're going to have to talk about it. A ridiculous ride. He wasn't supposed to, to race on Saturday. He thought he will. I think Geyser's crash the week before at Lockett really made his mind up. He knew he still had a chance at the World Championship, and he thought, I'm just going to give this a go. His pain threshold's unbelievable, but his desire to win... Is, is something beyond belief, to be honest. The, the pain he's willing to go through to win a world championship is insane. And the way he was riding, even he came out and qualifying, I didn't know if he was going to be top 10 speed, top 20 speed, if he would do a lap or two at pace and it would be too sore. But he went pole. Guys are nicked the pole position from him. And Hurlings didn't kind of go back after him. So you could see he was riding pretty smart and qualifying. He just did what he could do and rested himself for the races. And then he got the starts, one race one, basically stopped Roman, Roman Fevre as if he didn't have a broken shoulder blade, made the move. And race two, in some ways, was, was even more heroic to go down and land on your, on your left shoulder, to come back through the field. I mean, he was passing riders that looked like they were grade C back markers in the first couple of laps. On, on their, everybody's a quality rider in that class. It was unbelievable. He caught him past even Caroli. To get up to fifth place, 
And at one point you thought he was going to go for Tim Geiser because Tim was just in front of him. And obviously he's the championship leader. And then I think Tim thought I can't get embarrassed and he lifted it up and Hurling's understandably was completely exhausted and his arm is tired and he settled for fifth, but he still got second overall. A podium, apologies to Roman Fevre, but Jeffrey Hurling's was the star of the show at Lommel. Unbelievable. It's not the first time we've heard, oh, the team don't want you to race. The doctor doesn't want you to race, but Jeffrey's just like, let's go. Unbelievable. How he can ride like that, I mean, and have that speed, it's just not normal. They don't make men like Jeffrey Hurling's like, but he's not, I don't think he's human. Unbelievable. Like, it, and see if it, if it wasn't for that crash in the second moto, I think everybody knows he would have went 1 1 there. It's just a pity in the second moto. He had to maybe he had to just give it everything he had, and he you know in the first moto he, he could conserve it a wee bit and behind Fever and but and he had to take a lot of risks in that second moto to pass guys and the way he was passing it I think by halfway point he was up to sick thick and then that's when he started to get tired which is a real shame because if he had that you know um hundred percent bike fitness and no sore shoulder I think it would have been a one one and but you know what the uh, considering he hadn't scored three in three motos coming into Lomo, only to be 42 points off the championship lead. Let's just hope he can stay fit the rest of the season. A nice three-week break after Latvia. This championship's only starting now. Let's go. He mentioned actually with the Finnish GP being cancelled and he had this break a- a- after Latvia, that that also helped make, make his mind up to try because he just had to get through Lomo and then Kegums next week or this week coming. And then he actually had three weeks to try and get the shoulder back to somewhat normal so he can really go for the rest of the championship. But he's only he's only 42 points back. He's missed three motos. By right, he should be leading the championship and have a, a somewhat decent decent lead. Obviously, the Monticelli thing happened and he's having to deal with what he's having to deal with. But Hurlings thought his championship was over. He gritted his teeth. He showed just not just the talent that he has to ride the bike, but the, the heart and the desire to keep riding through pain. I mean, he, he doesn't need the money. He doesn't have to do this, but he still wants to do it. And he wants it maybe more than anyone else has. And he's able to, to get it done. And I think everyone, I've seen even the, the US riders on his Instagram saying, what a job. And Hurling's worldwide, Hurling's is getting even in America, tremendous respect. And he deserves every bit of it for not just his speed, but his, his toughness, because that's every going to be every bit part of, as part of his legacy, as his raw speed right now. Well, it's a bit. It's about time he's getting that respect. I'll never forget Mexico. What he done? That was just incredible as well. The ride with a broken femur and to be a few laps off getting the world title. That there was that was the day that he really that he got my respect. Like, and I knew he there was he's a different breed when he'd done that. But, you know, it, it's, history seems to keep repeating itself with Jeffrey Hurling the amount of times he ride injured. But how that man rides in the pain he does and just sends it anyway, it's just unbelievable. It's going to be a really sad day when that man hangs up his boots because he's just different. He's just a different breed and different animal. Oh, you can only take your hat off to the guy. Unbelievable. I hope for his sake and he he can at least stay fit the rest of the season, even if he doesn't win the title, because then he can't, you know, the injury won't be the main reason. It's just heartbreaking that he's lost so many titles due to injuries before and not been able to finish the season. But hopefully this year he can stay fit the rest of the year now. And this three, as you mentioned, the break coming up should do him the world of good. Just needs to try and survive Latvia this weekend. After Lomo, uh, he's, how's he going to ride again this week after that? I don't know, but fingers crossed. Yeah, and obviously we did that podcast with the Stefan Everts, and I'm not sure his relationship with Jeffrey is is amazing at the minute. But that guy knows what it takes to be champion. He's a very tough man, as we all know. He's ridden with injuries. He rode with a broken collarbone within a couple of weeks in '94 to try and save a world championship. So he knows what it's about, and he still says Jeffrey Hurlings is an incredibly tough, tough human being and extremely de- determined in terms of his training and the amount of load he can put on his body. Stefan has said that even he couldn't put in the the, tra- the amount of load and the training hours that, that Jeffrey has done. So for a guy like Stefan Evers to have the respect he has for Jeffrey Hurlings, and I know Joel Smith has said similar about how he body wants it and how his life's on motocross, you can see it whenever these situations arrive. He, he just won't give in if the, if there's a way he'll do it. He's almost able to overpower what a human body's able to cope with to get the job done. It's it's unbelievable. 
Exactly, it's unbelievable. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want his body at 40 years old. My goodness, yeah. <laughs> he'll age rightly quick, like once he hangs his motocross boots up. But the amount of stuff he's been through with injuries wise, but unbelievable respect, unbelievable. It's great to see, like, and he's, he should be a real role model for riders growing up now. And in terms of the determination he has, not only sheer speed, but just the grit, the determination, and the desire just to clinch these uh, another world title. It's just remarkable, really. And there's always these debates about who the greatest of all time is, and that's obviously subjective, but there's always the same kind of riders that are put into the mix. Stefan Everts, Jean-Michel Bale, McGrath, obviously, regarding Supercross, Ricky Carmichael, sometimes James Stewart. But for me, Jeffrey's quite like James Stewart in that he has the speed. Now, you can obviously, you have to count titles like Caroli and, and Everts have, but for people that maybe just look at titles as the gross to be in the conversation of the greatest. I think that's a wee bit harsh on the air, like a guy like Stuart, but especially Jeffrey Hurlings, because when you can ride a bike like he has, and it's only really injury that's cost him the chance of, of getting to Stefan Ivers' record, regardless of what happens in the rest of his career, if his career ended now, he has to be regarded for me as one of the greatest of all time. Absolutely. When it comes to really rough tracks, I personally don't think anyone has ever rode a bike as quick as Jeffrey Hurlings has. But we all know injuries are the reason why he hasn't got more world titles. And you would think the way he's going now, he's going to break the GP record win. So at least he should have that one in his back pocket. And you would like to think he'll be able to win a fifth world title. Obviously, it's not he's not going to get close to average now, you would think. But, you know, everyone knows the reason for that, injuries. If he hadn't have got picked up all of these injuries, you can only imagine how many more GP wins and world titles he'd have. But... That's the sport, unfortunately. But in terms of raw speed and being able, and the way he can ride, negotiate the tough, rough tracks, just unbelievable. I don't think I've ever seen anything like it. I know Stefan Everts was unbelievable on the sand, but you have to consider the level these days too. It, the levels, in my opinion, has never really been higher. And the way he makes riders, you know, the way he just flies past them and they're unbelievably quick. It's just, I've never seen the like of it. Yeah, and he obviously went to America for a national, came from last to first there as well. He's, although he mightn't have the world championships, he's ticking all the boxes and all the things he has done. And as you say, if he can get close to or even beat Stefan's Grand Prix win record, that will at least give him some sort of massive statistic to underline for the next generation coming through that weren't, weren't around to watch Jeffrey in person, just how phenomenal he was. Exactly that. Uh, after that, the only thing that's left really is to get go one one at the motocross the nations. For some bizarre reason, he hasn't been able to do that yet. His countryman Glenn Codenhaus been taking the limelight from that event, but I think he'll be motivated to do a one one in the motocross the nations. And then, in terms of GP wins, there's not much left. And in the GP paddock, there's not much left for him to achieve. That's realistic because you know uh, with 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 the the ages, it's going to be very difficult to get the average ten, but. You know, if he can stay fit the next couple of years, he's the man to beat probably. So who knows what the future holds? Yeah, just on the motocross of nations, it's been confirmed that there will be no GP points this year that have been rumoured. And as a consequence, Tim Geiser has, I believe, already ruled himself out. Roman Fever isn't keen on racing either for France. Obviously, they're in the World Championship contention. But Jeffrey Hurlings has said he will ride for Holland. And for me, that's a that's a bit risky. I understand why he wants to do it, because Holland can win. And as you say, he hasn't went 1-1 out of his nations before. But it would be pretty hard to see him or, indeed, Tony Caroli have an injury at that race that, that could cost them their chance at a, at a World Championship. But as of now, the Motocross of Nations will go ahead in its, in its current format. No GP points on Hurlings and Caroli at this moment in time are going to ride. Yeah, I'm surprised that the the running with no GP points, but I think what has happened is in front of probably been you know speaking to the riders, um, the team managers of the nations, and they've maybe figured out that uh, the majority of the riders will race. And I think another point is the fans are very very negative about GP points. I'm not quite sure why because if you nail the format with GP points, it could actually be really really good. But um, it's important for in front that the, um, to have fans at that race because that's the whole point of the motocross the nations. It gets the most fan base, and that's where they make the money. So if only a few top GP guys won't be there, I do understand why they're keeping the traditional format. 
if I was the riders, I would, if I was a GP rider, I personally wouldn't be racing. And I think if they all came together and said they weren't going to ride, then the in front would change to run GP points. But due to the riders, you know, the Netherlands are probably going to be full strength. Italy are going to be full strength. So that's two good nations already. France, out of the ones that can win, France are going to be hurt the most with Fever pulling out. But if you're in front, that's probably not the end of the world. So it'll be interesting to see if um, how, it, how, how it all lines up heading into the event this year. Yeah, it remains to be seen how many elite riders will participate. As we mentioned, Roman Fevre won't. As I said, he's not planning on racing that event, but he certainly rode Lommel and he rode really, really well at Lommel. He finally, finally got that GP win. He's been knocking on the door of all season. Second in the first moto, again, he had a crash, but when he did crash, he was second behind Hurlings trying to chase him down after being passed. And the, the second moto, another crash again, but this time he was able to get back up and reel in Paul Jonas, who was having a fantastic ride on, on the gas gas. But Feverett made it happen. 2-1, right in the hunt for this championship now. A brilliant day for the Frenchmen. Obviously, the French guys aren't known for their sound speed necessarily, but Fervor's worked hard. Of course, he doesn't have the same kind of flow and momentum that a Jeffrey Herlings has grown up in Holland, but Fervor has made it work. It's a testament to his determination and his dedication to, to get good in the sand. He's always been brilliant on hard pack, coming from France with great throttle control, but he won the toughest GP of the year. He's five points off Tim Geyser. And as he said in his in his interview at the end of the race, he feels it could be his year this year. And I think you just have to give a round of applause to Roman Fevre for how he performed and his tenacity to keep going. Yeah, this season is just so unpredictable. If you if you've looked at this track so far this year, you know, you wouldn't up until this point, you wouldn't be too surprised at Roman Fevre winning. But the fact he hasn't won yet and it all falls into place at an early deep sand track a Lama. It just shows you how unpredictable MXGP is this year. I'm really pleased for him. He has finally got this GP win because he's been so close knocking on the door and speed is certainly not the issue with Roman Fever. Let's be clear about that. Speed is the least of his worries. He's been as fast as anyone this year. It's just been the crashes. He even had a crash at Lommel, but thankfully it was only a wee small tip over and he was still able to get up and come back to second. And then in the second one, he rode really, really well. Fantastic stuff to win a moto and to win the GP in style really unbelievable only five points off the red plate you cannot rule this guy out yeah and as well for his team obviously the Kawasaki um, his squad are moving to Ice 1 so the, the team that he's he's been run under at the minute this is a big nice send off for them and I think that was a very important part of, of Fevre winning as well he's able to give those guys credit and a big, a big send off for them, and to make them feel that they're doing a really good job with him on the bike to get around Lommel with the rain and everything. We saw a few bikes DNF, so great, great for the whole team, not just Roman himself. But more importantly, this World Championship is very much on for for Roman Fevre now, and it's going to be very interesting to see if he can keep this up and also cut out those those wee crashes as well, because he he's always struggled with starts, and this year he's getting the starts more often than not. He's He's in that top five. He's even had a couple of hole shots. That's always been something that's missing with him. And this year, he seems to have that sorted. Everything's going in the right direction for Roman Fevre. He's the toughest Sandris out of out of the way. And he won it. So there, there isn't a lot of weakness right now in, in Roman's game, as we mentioned, except for those those small mistakes, which he was actually a bit annoyed with again in the interview. But Roman Fevre came in maybe as a slight outsider for this World Championship. But right now, he's he's one of the big players in this World Championship. Very much momentum behind him. Definitely a guy to keep an eye on. Yeah, I mean, Fever's always had speed. That's never really been the issue. But this year, in my opinion, it's the best he's ever been riding. It's just the mistakes. And he's making, I think maybe he's riding more on the edge because he's so motivated to win another MXGP world title. I know he's won the championship before and he was really good that year. And he's, and he's always a top contender. But for me this year, the best he's ever riding in terms of speed and the starts are the big thing. I think whatever he did say he had a really good winter and whatever he's been doing in winter with the KRT team set up wise with the bike to get it out of the gate well. I don't think I remember Fever starting as well ever in his career really. So it's nice to see, you know, it makes life easier when you get out of the gate and position yourself well. That was always an issue for him in the past. So when you do that, it makes life easier and it's all going 
plan if he can just keep it in two wheels. You know, if he can win in Lommel, there's no doubt about it, he'll be able to win in hard pack. It's just a matter of time, you would think. So, you know, you really can't rule him out. Paul's Jonas, third place on the podium. Rode fantastic, even in the first moto. He, he wouldn't let hurlings by, but without a fight, Jeffrey had to really push to pass Jonas in that one. Second race, he led for a long time after after Fever crash. He actually pulled away to four second lead at one point, and it looked like he might actually win the thing. But Fever wicked it up at the end and, and made the move. But Jonas held it strong for second, despite the pressure from Prado and Latterly Geyser on the last lap. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant ride for the Latvian. Great for Gas Gas as well. I think after everything Paul Jonas has been through last last year, you can't be anything but but happy for him. He's a he's a nice guy, quite a quiet guy, but he does his talking on the track and he he really spoke loudly at, at Lamo. Brilliant performance and now he's heading into his home Grand Prix this weekend. Absolutely brilliant. Really, really good. And you know, it's quite hard to believe a former MX2 world champion and that was his first time leading an MXGP race. Hard to believe when a guy has that much talent. But obviously an injury last year wasn't ideal, but he's had a really good off-season, it seems. He's been really good this year. I think he stepped it up on the 450. And uh, it's no surprise to me to see him on the podium with the speed he's shown so far this season. And it was nice for it all to come together at normal 4-2. And a big up to the standing construct the Gas Gas team as well. Possibly won't be a full factory team next year. Paul's, I do believe, wants to stay there. And now they've got a podium. Hopefully the Austrians give that team full factory backing because I believe they really they really do deserve it. They're one of the best teams in the paddock. Tim Matthias, who runs the show there, uh, is always good at getting the best out of his riders. So fingers crossed for them that uh, they'll be staying together for 2022 because Jonas is riding the best he has in this class so far this season. Yeah, I'm asking they're getting the the riders, that's probably a team's first first priority, and that standing construct team does that every single year. It has to be one of the best teams you, you can ride for, because we saw it with Valentin Guayo a number of years ago on the Yamaha, we saw it with Glenn Coltenhoff going to a new level, and Paul Jonas has come from essentially a year off the couch, on the, on the couch with bad injuries to come back, and he's got a podium at his sixth GP of the season. That's that's brilliant, and it's brilliant for the team. It's, it underlines again what a what a good team they are, and they obviously make the riders feel comfortable on a personal level and on the on a riding level in terms of how they can get the machinery going for them. So it's good to to give the team a shout out as well. Jonas has obviously gelled quickly with with the people there, and as you said, that I think that team deserves a lot of credit and a reward in terms of manufacturer support going forward because they've, they've done a great job with yet another rider and Brian Bowers has actually been riding very well the last few weeks as well. He was top 10 again, 10th overall there at Lommel and I think that's that's testament again to, to how good this team is at getting riders to ride up, up to their potential. Yeah, even in the past when they were running Yamaha machinery, you know, even guys like Tonkov and Lieber, really good for them. I think with that team there's a really good atmosphere, really good vibe. They let, you know, you let the riders maybe do what they want, but they're able to sign the right the right rider to fit the team as well. You know, so there's a lot of trust there, and I think that goes a long way. And yeah, just like you said, Brown Bodgers also has a lot of potential as a rider, and to go 11-11 for 10th overall is also a very good result. I think he rode the 2023 Gas Gas in Lockhart, uh, but uh, he was back on his usual machinery at Lommel, and he, I think he was a bit more comfortable in that, so I think there has to be a bit more testing done with the 2023 model, but uh, I'm no doubt Bodgers will be uh, involved with that as the season develops. And Jorge Prado, fourth overall, he probably wanted a podium. He's, he's obviously good in the sand, but a crash in the first moto when he had to come through the pack with, with Geyser to get seventh. Third in the second one, not the best day for Jorge Prado, but I think under the the circumstances he's mentioned, he's still under undergoing issues with with COVID. His lungs still aren't back to hundred percent, and if you aren't a hundred percent on a track like Lommel, it's not going to be easy. Even if you are as talented as the young Spaniard is on sand, fourth so fourth overall, he's gained points on Tim Geyser, two twelve to, to two twenty six. So Prado is is making his way slowly but surely into this championship hunt. I think when he when he walks away, he'll actually be quietly satisfied with that day. Now, there's, there's been talk that he isn't completely happy 
with the KTM at the minute in terms of, of bike settings and the direction that's going. So that could be another issue that, that he's working on trying to to resolve. And so look for his level to probably keep increasing as this, as he gets hopefully more comfortable on the bike and as, as health issues and fitness issues continue to, to climb up better. Prado's positioned himself despite all of this right in, in the championship hunt and for an okay day to gain championship points on the championship leader. I think Prado is slowly becoming a, a big factor in this championship for me. Yeah, he really is. I still feel like he's the rider that's the furthest away from his full potential so far. So for him only to be 14 points off the championship lead. By the way, there's four riders within 14 points. How exciting is this for the championship? Really, really good. And yeah, Prado, I think, will be satisfied. Maybe a little bit disappointed with the first moto. But all in all, fourth overall, 14 points off a championship lead. You know, you, you can't count him out either. And um, if he gets uh, this fitness to, to improve and uh, maybe gets the bike set up more to his liking, you still can't count Prado out. He's the sort of guy, when he's feeling confident, he's feeling good on the bike. You know, he's capable of running in the top three every single week. So could be an exciting uh, few GPs to come ahead for Prado. Tim Geyser, sixth overall. Where do we start with Tim Geyser? What an up and down weekend. He was up and down as much as the bumps were, were high and low at Lommel. He st- we discussed last weekend about what way he was going to play Lommel, whether he was going to go for the consistent approach, top five podium, and whether he's going to go out and try and win and show his speed against the, the best sand riders. He did the latter, and that was clear in qualifying. As soon as Herlings went pole, Geyser came out. I went quicker, and even on one of Hurling's fast laps at the start, who was behind him? Tim Geyser. So he obviously had the mentality that he wanted to win in the sand, win in Lommel again, against Jeffrey Hurlings, against Tony Crowley, against everyone. And he, even he had that crash in the, in the first moto. He always looked a wee bit on edge for some reason all day, even in the qualifying he had a crash. He was very lucky Glenn Coldenhoff didn't land on him. That was, that, that was pretty dodgy. But nothing seems to seem to change. He kept pushing. And one thing you can't say about Tim Geyser is, is that he's a quitter. That guy doesn't quit. He keeps going and he keeps going. But halfway through that, that second moto, he crashed two or three times. I thought we're going to have to give him a husky and call him RJ Hampshire because I've never really seen so many <laughs> crashes except from RJ Hampshire recently. But Geyser, you have to give him credit. He never stopped pushing. His speed was actually really good. He's looking more and more more like a sand rider, the way he manipulates the bike. He's not quite on a hurling's the wolf level, obviously, but he isn't far off. And he, he rode he rode really well in terms of speed, but the results, sixth place in those crashes, he said himself he made too many mistakes. And um, this season, at the start of the year, it looked like Geyser was in complete control that he'd went to another level. He won three of the first four motos, but he hasn't won a moto since that, that second moto at, at Matterley Basin. And that's four rounds later now without winning a moto. Geyser's actually, although he's still got the championship lead by five points, he's in a bit of a sticky point in, in this championship and questions are starting to be asked of him. He's making more mistakes. The crashes have come back, which at the start of the year looked like weren't, weren't happening anymore. Fervor's on form. Crowley's hanging in there. Prado's catching and Jeffrey Hurling, who we all thought was out of it came back and he came back because of a Geyser crash. So Geyser literally opened the door for Hurlings to do this. He's only 42 back and he's obviously going to get stronger. Geyser has a lot of things going on right now in his mind, I'm sure, because everybody's catching him. It's not just one guy he's fighting. He's four riders behind him. They all think they can be world champion this year and they're seeing Tim make mistakes. Yeah, the first four rounds, Tim Geyser was unbelievable. Not a mistake in sight, but the last two rounds is... The geyser that we've seen in the past, very fast geyser, but one that um, can throw it down the track. And uh, I think for him, maybe just hit the reset button, just chill it out a little and go in and have the mindset that he came into the season with. Think if he does that, if he does do that, he'll be fine. But, you know, after Latvia, it's quite, in a way, it's quite good that there's a three week break because they'll all go and start doing their homework at the practice track again and then come back far and ready to go. So, um, I think if he has the red, red plate after that field, he'll be happy enough. And then obviously there's quite a lot of hard pack to come. So that, that, that them conditions will favour him. But, you know, in terms of the championship battle, it's absolutely, it's sort of, it's, it's made it good the way Geyser's had a couple of bad rounds in terms of results, even though his speed has been still really good. So uh, it's it's great as a fan for neutral to, 
to see this championship so close. It's going to be really fascinating. Hopefully they can all stand you free as well. Yeah, the one good thing for Tim is that his speed isn't really the issue, but mistakes and, and not getting moto wins, moto wins breed confidence, obviously, and everybody else is getting those moto wins and getting that confidence. Tim seems to have, have the speed still to do it, but everything's just not coming together for him. Latvia he has been fast in the past, but he also, he's also had a couple of big crashes there. Now, obviously, it's not Lommel, so to count guys are out of a win, I think would be foolish this weekend. He'd want to turn the momentum back in his favour, but as you say, he has a lot of hard pack coming up again, so I think it's important for him not, not to really go mad in Latvia and throw it down the track again because you can only crash so many times and not get hurt at some point. He might get hurt, and nobody wants to see that. And we all want to see all these riders fight for this World Championship healthy. And may the best man win right now, Geyser is still the best man. He has the, the points lead. But as you said, this is getting close. And everyone down to Hurlings believes they can be world champion, including Antonio Caroli, who didn't have his best day, surprisingly. In the in the deep sand, he mentioned he, he couldn't get a good feeling with the track and with his bike and, and get the flow going. He brought it back pretty good in, in the first moto, a couple of late race passes up to third. You thought he was probably going to get a podium again. But second moto seventh, as we say, Hurlings came from last to catch and pass him. Not the performance you expect from Tony Caroli, but he did gain two points in Tim Geyser. He's only nine back. And for a relatively bad day for, for a rider of that ability in the sand, Caroli has to look at the positives. He's still very much in this championship. He's still gained points in Tim Geyser. And it's still all to play for for his 10th world championship. Yeah, it's the same old story with uh, Crowley the last few GPs. One good moto and then one not so good moto. But the same, you know, finish seventh at a rough, gnarly, deep soundtrack, you know, seventh in the second moto. Very, very surprising. Not sure what that would be down to, but I can't remember. I can't remember the last time he struggled so much in the sand. So a bit of a head scratcher in the second moto there. But as you said, he needs to look at the positives. He's only nine points off the championship lead still well and truly in the championship chase and he's a very smart rider at the end of the day so it'd be foolish to ride him off but um, he'll be looking to sort to, to sort his consistency issues out and put two good motos together and not fit heading into the break and that'll give him a bit of confidence he needs hopefully Yeah the only time I was saw kind of performances like that was when he was riding injured with his knee last year so hopefully his knee is still okay he hasn't tweaked it or anything because I think he deserves a healthy shot at this 10th World Championship this year and you wouldn't want that type of injury to start nagging him again throughout the season to where he can't show his full potential. So hopefully that second moto was just a bit of a blip and Crowley will be backfiring in Latvia. He's proven there that this nation's on Grand Prix that he's very, very fast. So we might just see him, if he can get these these starts and, and this intensity and, and the first moto back again, he could be back up challenging for the win. A rider I want to mention... We've done it the last few weeks with Calvin Belandron. Another great ride, great speed, eighth overall. This time, no, no crashes to ruin his, his overall result. He was still able to, to to get a top 10 overall. Brilliant ride, top non, non-factory non rider as well. And Belandron's really, really, really coming on strong at the minute. Yeah, a, vi- a nice solid day for him, 10-10 for eighth overall. I think he still wants more, but... You know, it's the second time this year after us where he's put two top 10 motos together. So that's this is the sort of consistency he's been after. I think it's important to have this sort of consistency before we, we he gives us a wee bit more. But I still do feel like he has the potential to be in the top seven or eight. But I think with Calvin, it's just all about progress. And I know Latvia is one of his favourite tracks. So don't be too surprised if it, all, if it even goes better for him there. But it's nice to see him show his full potential, absolutely. And it's nice to see the Geb and Van Venry, Yamaha guys, have good results in such a competitive GP class. It's not easy um, not having been a factory team. So, you know, they might have even put themselves in a shop window to get a bit of factory support in 2022 because I'd like to see Vlander with a bit of factory support. I feel like he deserves it. On the factory Yamaha team themselves, not a bad day, but I'm sure they were hoping for a bit more. Jeremy Sewer rode well, solid. Seventh overall, not too bad for him. Although, again, I'm sure he kind of wanted to be pushing that top five podium. But a decent day for Jeremy. Ben Watson had a good start, was showing good speed. He still came, came ninth overall. So I think for Ben, top 10 consistency. And he got a good look at the front again. But clearly, 
that pace at the front when you're when you're trying to run it can take its toll and it's just easy to lose your rhythm and it maybe looked like that happened to Ben in the first moto but still ninth overall at that Lommel that's I think that's a decent performance the guy who's going to be most disappointed is, is Glenn Coldenhoff not because I don't think he, he was was riding bad or anything I think he was riding well but he was coming from the back both motos he had that collision with Herlings and Herlings went to go up in the inside of him in, in the second moto 11th overall for Coldenhoff, but he never really got a chance. He never got to see the front guys, the pace at all. He was just battling two very hard motos and, and that sand to come through the field. He's, he's got to be frustrated with that one. Yeah, very frustrating for Glenn Coldenhoff. In the sand, if you go down at the first corner, it's it's difficult, difficult to come back through the pack. Okay, yes, it's easier to pass riders in sand that would be in hard pack, but because it's so e- it's easier to make a difference, the guys at the front are gone by the time you get into a decent position. I actually thought he rode really well actually in the first moto to come back up the ninth. Thought for a minute he might even catch Geyser, but then I think he got stuck behind a couple of riders and, and then Geyser lifted the level up again. But first moto, I thought he rode really well. Second moto, probably be a wee bit disappointed only to get back up the 13th, but... You know, it's not easy when you go down at the first corner and he was probably spent as well because he was pushing all day to pass riders and was probably taking more risks than he would have liked than if he'd have got a good start when, you know, you can follow the guys in front before, you know, lifting the pace at certain times whenever you feel more comfortable. And yeah, Ben Watson thought he had a good solid day, 12-9 for ninth overall. And I think you're absolutely spot on with Ben. He looks good until riders start passing him. And then I think he loses a wee bit of rhythm and concentration maybe. And then maybe tries uh, tries a wee bit too hard then instead of trying to latch onto them and just try and follow them. But that'll all come with experience. It was the same problem in MX2 he had in his early career in, in that class where guys would pass him and he'd get all stressed and then lose a few positions. But this will all come with experience in the class. Ninth overall and the get back into ninth in the championship for a rookie and after a bad start in Russia you can only really good say, say good things about Ben at the moment and lastly on Sir probably you'd say the best of the rest nothing spectacular but nothing disastrous either a nice solid day for 5-8 for 7th overall not too bad at all but uh, I'm sure we'll see him in the top 5 again soon On the ice one Husqvarna boys I mean it's just a Kunis 12th overall they had a good moto and a bad moto each Jasek Kunis, just two points in the first one, but a sixth place in race two, rode, rode really, really well. Wasn't too far off of Hurlings as well once, once, Je- once Jeffrey passed him, beat Karuli. So definite encouragement for Jasek Kunis there. His selling skills are still very much there. I know he's still struggling to, to pick up his own level on the hard pack, but great for Jasek Kunis to get a sixth. That's, that's fantastic for him. Thomas Kerr-Olsen. The inverse, he had a good a good first moto, eighth in the first one, and then only three points in the second one. So the consistency there for, for the factory Husky boys still still waiting on that a wee bit. Probably would have won a top ten overall, but if I've mentioned it's a very tough class and you make mistakes, it's gonna it's gonna be hard to, to pull through unless you're called Jeffrey Jeffrey Hurlings. But an oh so so day for them. But a guy I really want to mention is Cyril Gano, fourteenth overall in MXGP. You'd done an interview with him and he wasn't sure what to expect. He hadn't set any really high goals or anything. Obviously, he is brilliant in sand coming from Belgium. But I remember him on a 125 Yamaha and the same 14th overall in MXGP as in a, on a private effort on such a such a tough class with, with very good riders behind him. I think that has to be applauded. And that's, that's a, he's got to walk away there very, very happy with that performance. Yeah, this kid's good. Two years ago at Lama, I think he was eighth overall in MX2. Really, really good in sand, and he's he he knows how to ride the bumps and the gnarly stuff anyway. But you know, he ha- this is his first MXGP of the year in a very tough class. You know, you never really know until you're there on the day how it's all going to go. But for him to go 15, 12, 14th overall, really, really good promise and stuff on the Sarholz KTM. I just wish he could ride like that in hard pack. It's sort of been the story of his career: really fast in sand, hard pack the results aren't always there but you know he's a young rider in the 450 I think he's only 22 so it could be potential there it'd be interesting to see how his career goes and if he can land a full-time MXGP ride well Alberto Ferrato 15th overall things are starting to come together for the for the big Italian Sand obviously 
mightn't be his best, although he is actually pretty pretty good in the, in the soft stuff. But he's had a tough start of the year with, with injury and trying to pick up his pace in a new class. He's starting to show signs that he's getting there. Sean Simpson, good first moto. He'll be disappointed with the, the mechanical in, in the second, but he was he was on for, for a good day as well. So Simpson, two, two good GPs in, in terms of speed for him. He can take encouragement from that. And Evgeny Bobrashev, he was looking really good at the British Championship at the start of the season, but that, that injury, I think it was actually a shoulder blade as well. For him, it took, took the, the steam out of him, and he's starting to come back now. 18th overall, but a good point scoring ride in race two. Bob Rousseff, he's known for being tough as well, so a, a Lommel GP was probably, probably right up his street. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, Alberto Ferrado, I mean, this guy hardly had a winter. At the last minute, instead, of, he was supposed to be race MX2. At the last minute, they decided to put him in MXGP because he's good on a 450. Obviously, looking at him, he, it's the right bike, I think, for him. But for him already to go 14-14 for 15th overall, very, very promising. And an MXGP, because the results haven't been so, so good so far, you know, and an MXGP, the confidence can take a bit of a hit. But I think that should do him the world of good and hopefully he can build on this now because I do feel like he's got the potential to maybe have a career similar to Jasakonis because, you know, being big guys, didn't have much of a career on a 250. Ferrato actually did somehow. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so hopefully he can build on this and step in the right direction. Another guy I would like to give a shout-out to actually is Lars Van Berkel. He was riding as a wild card for the SR Honda team. And for him to get points in both motos, 2017 for 19th overall, I think he can be very content with that. Yeah, as a sound guy again coming up trumps and Lommel, who would have thought it? But yes, very good, very good ride for Lars. Top 20 in MXGP, yeah, you have to go home happy with that, especially whenever whenever you're a wild card. Todd Kellett as well, he he filled in for Onatunas. He got a point, so he can he can be pleased with that. He's obviously good in the sand, known for the Western Beach race and stuff, but Lommel... Lomas is a bit different to that again, so good to see him get get a get a point and a great opportunity for him actually to, to ride for that team with Arnatona still uh, on on the couch after suffering a concussion, which is why he hasn't been at the last two races. But we'll move on now to MX2 and Yago Gertz. He's really establishing himself as, as the title challenger to, to Maxime Renault. I think first moto win, Renault made a mistake. Gertz was there there to capitalise. Second moto, he put all the pressure on, on Kaido Wolf. He couldn't quite make the pass, but he got the overall win at home. So he had a lot of pressure on his shoulders. Sometimes pressure hasn't always been good for Gertz, but he delivered again. He's 28 points back. He's the shark in the water now for, for Maxime Renault. Absolutely. You've hit the nail on the head there. I think he is. It's gonna. You would think the way things are going, the championship's looking like it's going to go to one of the Yamaha riders anyway. Gertz is after, you know, the engine and everything. Now he's only 28 points off. Um, you know, it's. I think he needs to just first look at, at himself into second. He's still fourth, but you would think it won't be too much longer until he works himself into second. And then when he does that, he can really set his sights on catching this point deficit to Maxime Renault, who himself rode actually really well. But in that second moto, you just have to take your hat off to Gertz and Kaido Wolf unbelievable speed really really good you know half the field were by the end of that were just surviving and them two were just putting in putting in the laps constantly and consistently and it was really good to watch just take your hat off them unbelievable the way they were riding the bumps yeah Gertz I think's only two points behind second so he's he's effectively right there already he just has to get it done in Latvia if he can get the starts which for Gertz, he's starting to get consistent good starts as well now. Everything seems to be coming together for him. And Maxime Renault, we'll talk about in a minute, but he looks he looks mentally strong and ready to fight for this championship. Before we get to him, Kai De Wolf, you mentioned him there. Good ride in the first one, came through to third. The elastic band man was doing it again, just moving his body every which way, bending corners, bending around bumps. He makes it look pretty easy and, and very fluid, but that second race... We saw an Aussie pass Gertz and then crashed. This time he got the whole shot, didn't have to pass Gertz. He set the pace, only Gertz could match. And as a matter there were a minute, 59 seconds ahead of Renault in third. This was a high-level pace and a high-level race. And 16-year-old to win your first moto. And to do it with Gertz, who was probably the preseason favourite along with Vial for this World Championship, breathing down your neck. 
Angert's put on a big charge the last two laps to pass him. He has the talent and he has the speed, but he showed he now has the mental strength and the self-belief to maintain his speed under big, big pressure. When it really counts, the Wolf delivered. And that mental strength is very, very important if you want to be world champion. And the Wolf looks like he's ticking all the boxes already. Yeah, we'll have to remember this kid's 16 years old. Here's a question for you. Since, obviously, Ken Roxon and Jeffrey Hurlings at 15 and 16 years old were unbelievable in MX2. But since then, is Kaido Wolf maybe the best 16-year-old to race the MX2 World Championship? Prado. I know, obviously, we're, we're, Prado, was he in MX2 at 16 or was he in the MX2 50? I think he was racing by 16 because he MX2 challenged her in yeah. at 15. But, yeah, yeah I think since yeah. Prado, you're going to have to start putting the Wolf on that Prado yeah. Prado level because he looks like he could be that good, especially once he gets his hard pack. Yeah. Sort of, he's already good there, but once he gets that close to his sound skills, and don't forget, this is only his sixth Grand Prix ever. You know, he's, yeah, he's, he's won a race already. He nearly won two races already. And he's already kind of top five, kind of 48 speed on, on hard pack. And there's a lot more to come. His learning curve is still at a quite a low level in terms of how much he can improve. This guy's going to be gonna be big time. Yeah, he takes it all in the stride as well. Really impressive. You know, he, he's really happy about winning his first MX2 moto and he's happy to be in the podium again. But, you know, you can tell... It's, he's not completely shocked by it. So he clearly believes in his abilities and it's great to see. And the Netherlands can get very excited about Kaido Wolf, I think, after the likes of Hurlings and Kodenhoff. They're in good hands, I think, with Kaido Wolf coming up. Very, very good. And we talked about the Disnations earlier. Jeffrey Hurlings thinks he's a team that come in the Disnations, obviously. And with Rowan van der Moestijk injured, their backup, if he is a backup anymore, Kaido Wolf, he could blow a few minds at the to Mantova as well because that's pretty sandy going and if he gets a good start he could uh, really make a, a name for himself there especially in front of the American media as well he mightn't be as familiar with him when he's just riding Grand Prix but that guy could could really set his star for even bigger at, at Mantova if he's chosen for, for Holland for the Motocross of Nations and a combined 250-450 race could be pretty special if he gets a start yeah, I think a decision might have to be made there now, you know, the team manager for the Netherlands. Obviously, Roman van der Moestijk selected. I believe he's hoping to be back on the bike at the end of August, all being well. So that'll give him just less than a month to prepare. It's going to be an interesting one. Uh, obviously, Roman van der Moestijk, if he you know, hasn't had this injury, the way he was riding speed-wise, you pick him, but... It's just whether he's going to be 100% ready for this event. And even if he's 10% off the way Kaido would throw Derek Lama, it would have took some going for Rowan to, to beat him. He might have ran with him, but to beat him the way he rode, it's, it would have been a, a tough ass possibly, especially because Rowan starts aren't great. Kaido would, because he's a wee bit lighter maybe and has the factory husky, starts are maybe more positive for him. So it'll definitely be interesting. If definitely, the Dutch definitely have something to think about now. Yeah, it's pretty amazing that they have so many good riders to choose from that can afford almost for, for Van de Moestijk to get injured, to have the Wolf come in. And Brian Bogers is sitting pretty good in MXGP now to fill in if, if any of their guys get hurt and you could still have a podium chance there. So brilliant for Holland, a small country, to have so many elite level level riders. But Maxime Renault, he looks like he's playing the, playing the long game. Yes, he had a mistake in the first one he was disappointed with. But he's not throwing it down the track in a way that he's he's going to struggle to to get a point, or he's going to end up fifteenth at the minute. He's limiting damage on bad days and winning when he can. Again, sand wouldn't be his favourite surface. He alluded to it a wee bit in, in the interview after he was happy to come away with the podium there. He didn't lose too much, too many points to Gertz, just five, and he has hard pack coming up as as we mentioned before. Renault looks like from the start of this season he's had the championship on his mind and he's. Not going to do anything silly to, to, to jeopardize that. Very solid day for Maxime Renault. He's really put himself front and center for this championship. I'm sure he knows Gertz is coming, but to me, it looks like he's mentally prepared for this fight. Absolutely. And the thing about it is, the starts have been quite good recently. So he's able to position himself well from the start of Motos. So he, it, it means he's not having the panic coming through the pack. It'll be interesting to see what happens if he does get a bad start and all on, on, on how he reacts. I, I feel like he's not riding on the edge and he probably has that 1% or 2% more if he needs it 
So for him to go two, three, third overall and have a 26 points gap in the championship now, in terms of the championship, that was a very, very good day for the French man. And he'll be hoping it continues like this. His teammate Thibaut Benesson, fourth, which meant three Camille Yamahas in the top four. This team's starting to take over MX2 at the minute. He was he surprised me, to be honest, obviously when the weekend went on the hard pack, but to go four or five four as it was in the motos, really impressive. He, he gave Renew a pretty Renew a pretty good battle as well. Benison, I thought the sand was gonna be his his weaker point. And he's he's proven me 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 wrong really at, at Lommel. He was very, very competitive, fourth overall. I wouldn't say he's right in championship contention, but he's not completely out of it. He's within the fifty points still. And we know he can win motors and hard pack. So if, if your weakest in quotation marks surface is a fourth overall at Lommel, and he's think he's only turned nineteen, so he's he's very young. He's gaining experience every week. He could be really something special in, in another couple of rounds once he once he gets a wee bit more experience because things are starting to come together for him on a consistent basis already. And he's already got two motor wins and now it looks like he's starting to put it together in the sand. Absolutely, and he's starting to become a lot more consistent too. First couple of rounds, up and down, you would say, but as he learns the class, learns the competition, um, and probably benefits from having the factory set up as well and everything that goes with it, you know, having Gertz and Renault to put motos in with during the week, that's only going to help him as he's a young rider. Yeah, uh, very good in the sand. First motor he rode really, really well. Didn't get the best of starts, but he came back to fifth and he had no front brake, so... Really, really good. And then the second moto, he, he, he proved it was no fluke and came home in fourth. So sixth overall, I think he can be very, very happy with how his rookie season is going. And I'm sure he'll get plenty more podiums as the season goes on and maybe a few overall wins as well. He's certainly capable. Definitely, yeah. He's, he's an exciting rider to watch this season. Jed beaten fifth overall. Good day for Jed. The sand is never going to be easy when you've had to come from Australia and learn to ride it. But fifth overall, I think, is good for him. He seemed a, a little bit disappointed. But as I say, fifth overall against Iago Gerson, a Kai De Wolf. They're they're on a different level. He might have thought he could he could get the best of Renault and Beniston. It wasn't to be a couple of mistakes here and there. But overall, a good performance by Jed Beaton and Ruben Fernandez. He's hanging on in there in this in this Tour Championship battle. Sixth overall, Sand obviously isn't his favourite surface, but once again, he fought hard. Didn't give anyone an inch. He had a couple of good battles with with Vial and Pastrami and the likes of them. Just does never gives in. He'll definitely be looking forward to the hard pack again to try and get some momentum back and start getting them in the top three and trying to get Muda wins. But in terms of essentially damage limitation for the championship, he's got to walk away pretty happy. He's kept himself in, in with a shite, no big mistakes, no DNFs. Fernandez, pretty solid, solid day for him, sixth overall on the 114 Motorsports Honda. Yeah, I think beating Nan Fernandez should both be happy. You know, Sam isn't both the forte, so come away fifth and sixth overall it certainly could have went a whole lot worse and Fernandez especially will be really he'll be itching to get back into this hard pack because we all know he excel in those conditions and the speed he showed at the start of the season was very very surprising to a lot of people so for him to go six seven in the sand you know he's going to be he could be a top three on the hard pack again so you still can't rule him out you really can't and it's nice to see a Honda uh, performing to this consistent level in MX2 it's really impressive what they've got going there at the moment. Conrad Muse, you had to feel sorry for Conrad Muse in that first photo. From free practice, he went fastest. You were like, finally, Conrad Muse is riding up to his potential. This is brilliant. It made the day pretty exciting because you knew when he's on that form, he's probably going to stay on that form all day. He backed it up with fourth in time qualification. He got a start in the first photo. He was, I think it was actually DeWolf he was starting to close into. He'd just done his fastest lap. And then a mechanical ruled him out and you just felt gutted for him because this was everything he wanted. This was everything he'd worked all winter for, to ride this potential at a Grand Prix, qualify well, get a start, be there with all the main players and have the speed to go with him. It looked like he couldn't have ruled him out for a potential podium, maybe even a Moto win or at least a, a battle for that at some point. But to his credit, he, he overcame that disappointment. He was obviously pretty annoyed by it, but he came back was running top five. He was actually all over Beniston, and then he had to pull in for, for fresh goggles. He dropped a spot then. He couldn't quite get beaten, although he was all over him at the end. 
but Conrad Mews, although he's going to be frustrated with the first one, he has to be happy with sixth, but more importantly, he has to be happy that he had top five spe- speed with the fastest MX2 riders in the world. This was Conrad Mews back where he belongs. Yeah, out of for all the races for him um, to have a mechanical, that certainly wasn't it. Uh, if it happened at any of the first five rounds, that would have been a lot better, put it that way. You know, he had just positioned himself nicely and he looked comfortable running that pace, catching the guys in front of him. And as you said, he had just set his fastest lap of the race. And then, kaboom, uh, devastating if you're Conrad Mews. But um, hopefully he can take confidence from that and, t- and take that into that field. We can see that sort of speed from him again. And again, he ended the weekend on a high, finishing sixth. You know, after a difficult start to the season, you're not just going to go from 15th to battling in the top three. So... To get sixth, very good end of the weekend. 14th overall still isn't what they're looking for, but the bike played its part in that one. Otherwise, it, you would think it would have been a top five overall at worst. So I think he should be happy with the speed this weekend. Hopefully that's the Conrad Muse back that we all know now. Well, unfortunately for him, just when he starts to get the momentum rolling in the Grand Prix, I believe he's to race the British Championship oh, right. no, I next weekend because that, yeah. of that bizarre decision to put it on during a Grand Prix weekend. So Conrad, just when he has the momentum, probably would have went really well at Latvia. It sort of suits him that track as well. Now he's to go back to, to the British. Obviously, he's really fast there and he wants to win a British title. But for Muse, speed in Britain isn't the problem. For Muse, the whole point is to try and get into this World Championship and bring that British speed to there. He did that in Lommel. Just when he starts to do that now, he's a bit of a wrench thrown in the whole, the whole swing of things back to Britain. He'll have three weeks after that, hopefully, to try and get things together again. Hopefully, it might actually work in his favour, I suppose, if he if he gets the win and the British gets the confidence. But I feel it would have been ideal time to, to go to Latvia with the momentum he has from, from Lommel and get a back-to-back top 10 and probably top 5 speed. If he can show that again in Latvia, it would have been fantastic. But with the British Championship doing that, it's made it difficult for him and the Hitachi KTM Milwaukee squad. They were put in a very difficult position, as were all the other British teams. I don't think they're they're too happy about it, but it is what it is, and you just have to deal with that. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Ad. Actually, I completely slipped my mind, but yep, you're right, and it is a big shame that uh, the British Championship is colliding with MXGP, especially with Finland being constant now. That the three weeks they could have had it on, and at Whitby earlier in the year they had a British Championship, but they didn't have the MX1 or MX2 classes. You would have thought they could have could have run it without a fan. But obviously not. They've run it with MXGP, which is a shame. Fortunately for them, most of the British riders are going to race. So actually, they're not out too much. But uh, for the riders itself, themselves, it's very frustrating. Yeah, we'll see him use back in Turkey now. So hopefully he can bring the speedy hat at Lommel there to, to, Tur- to Turkey with him. Mario Guadagnini in the championship hunt just after a brilliant day at Lockett. But again, the sand bit him. He hadn't even got round turn one and he was on the deck, which was the complete nightmare scenario that he was probably trying to avoid so I think he he rode a wee bit sore for for the rest of the day he definitely doesn't look like a a natural sand rider but he gives everything he has salvage not too bad a a 12th overall but not the day Guadagnini wanted Renault gained a lot of points on him and now he's kind of put himself in a position where he's gonna have to do what he did in Lockett and come back and win again to really keep himself in in this championship hunt of field but first year in the class you kind of have to allow him this a bit of growing pains to feel in the sand. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's a rookie at the end of the day and no one expected him to be in this position after six rounds of the championship. So it's still a positive season for him. And in the sand races, I feel like he's been a wee bit unlucky as well. Obviously, he's a much better hard pack rider, but starts haven't been kind to him in sand uh, and he hasn't really been at the front. I feel like if he got a start, top five start, he's probably good enough to learn the rider from the riders in front of him and to hang in there a little. So I think if, if he can just get two good starts in Latvia, that should be the plan and then go from there. And I feel like he can probably run top five, certainly better than a 12th overall with 14-10. That was not what the doctor ordered, but a bit of bad luck there as well at the same time. But yeah, still a very positive season for him and don't think we're going to be too critical. Bastien Modam impressed me again. 13th overall, he's getting starts, he's showing good speed. He seems to be pretty good in, in every condition. You've got to thank some of the, the top teams that might have been knocking on his door this winter. Yeah, it was a pity to see. I think he was in sixth in the first one when he crashed. That was a bit of a shame, but 
you know, he battled away and still made some passes to go home, come home in 12th. And he backed that up with 13th in the second moto. I agree. I think factory teams, if they need a rider, they should be one of the guys that could be looking at. I'd like to see him working with a top class coach as well. Cause I feel like I could really help his development. Uh, for, uh, he's a talented guy. Like, so uh, I would like to see him maybe with a factory ride if, if, if he can secure one in 2022. Tom Vial, he's probably made more mistakes in the last couple of, at Lommel in the last Moto and Lockett than he did in a whole season last year. Obviously, it's pretty understandable coming back from a hand injury when you haven't been riding to, to ride a, a track like that. That's not easy at all. He still got seventh overall. I think we can all say his speed is still there. It's just a bit of race, race rustiness and, and rustiness from, from a lack of riding that's really costing Tom. But nice to see he doesn't give any, he keeps pushing. And seventh overall, not too bad for him, despite a, a couple of crashes and obviously a complete lack of bike time and a hand that probably still hurts a bit, especially around there. Yeah, I mean, that track was absolutely brutal and hand injury and definitely not ideal. I actually felt like he rode really well in the first moto to get fourth, but things just didn't go his way in the second moto with 11th. You know, the championship's over for Vial now, so if he can just... Uh, take the pressure off him if he if he had any to start with. Um, he just enjoy himself the rest of the season. Have fun. I'm sure it'll not be long until he can win motos and overalls again. And and it's all about 2022 for him now, really, and try and win another world title. Simon Langenfeld, a decent day from him. Ninth ninth overall. He's starting to build consistency. Although he's, you probably would want him closer to the top five more often. But Langenfeld is starting to. Get a get a foundation here, I think, to, to really attack the top five, top six soon, especially if he, if he can get good starts. Rene Hoffer probably expected a wee bit more from him. Struggles slightly. Tenth overall, still okay. And Michael Harrop, eleventh overall, tied on points with Hoffer actually on nineteen. Decent for him. I think he has more speed in him, or at least more raw speed. But you, you need the starts. But for Harrop, consistency's kind of been been his issue. If he's starting to get the consistency a wee bit like Lagenfelder, his building blocks and he can get this foundation. Consistency in Lommel isn't easy and he's managed to do that and hopefully he can start to build once he gets this under his belt and then we can start to see that raw speed he has again. Yeah, it's just on Simon Lagenfelder. He actually lost his dog at Lockhart. Um, so he must have been riding there with a fried head. Like that's that's not a nice thing to happen. So fortunately they found it through uh, throughout the week. So he was back in Lommel with his doggy. And I'm sure he was a lot happier. Uh, so it was nice to see him ride this potential again after a not so great lockout. In the first moto, he was way, way down the order. So to come back to 10th was a really good ride. And ninth in the second moto, consistent day for ninth overall. Yeah, I feel like he needs a good start again. And then we'll see him right at the front. His starts haven't been so good recently. Hoffer, that's the kind of track that uh, he needs to improve on. So a solid 10th overall. Not too bad at all, but in the future, those are the kind of tracks that he's going to have to be a top five guy at. But uh, progress is, is, is what it's all about. And don't forget, we you missed a lot of racing last year. Harap, I maybe expect a little bit more from Harap at that kind of track. He usually really excels at those tracks, really good rough sand tracks. But it's hard when you don't get the start and you need to be you need to position yourself well in the motos and feel like he hasn't had a good start all year, really. So... Hopefully he can get out of the gate and uh, we can see him in the top 10 because I do feel like he belongs there if he can um, figure it all out. Yeah, he has speed. But as I said, just even getting that consistency, if he's getting bad starts and he's coming through and not, not making mistakes, that's actually that's actually good for him as well. Hopefully when he does get a good start, I think Boswami was in a similar situation. He wasn't getting amazing starts. He's fighting in the middle of the pack. Obviously he's not a... A natural sand rider, you could see that the way he was riding, hitting bumps that a lot of other guys weren't. He, he wasn't that fluid out there, but he, he has a, a big fighting spirit and he, he held on for eight. So an okay day for the FNH Kawasaki guys. Is there anyone else you want to give a mention to in MX2? Um, yeah, I thought Glenn Meyer, he's not racing the full MX2 World Championship this year, just some wild cards, but for him to go 13 17 for 15th overall, I thought was pretty impressive. He's rode MX2 in the past with the JK Yamaha team, but never really had top results at God. So that, that was that was a good day for him. And a guy, Petr Polak, Czech Republican, 15-16, two solid days, or two solid motos 
uh, consistent 17th overall. Very good for him, I would say. Uh, usually battling the points, so for him to be 15, 16 is very good. And I feel like he goes under the radar because he's a he's a regular point scorer. But that was that was a step up for him. Finally, just before we go, EMX 250. A quick few thoughts on that. Rick Elzinga won a race again. Brilliant ride in the second moto to, to take the win. But Nicholas Lapucci, he's shown he doesn't have any real weaknesses. Fast in the sand, the roughest track you could throw at an Italian. He came through again, first and second. And Liam Everts, he's now up to fourth in the championship. He made a mistake in the first one, but rode really well to come through. Again, didn't quite get into his rhythm quick enough in the, in the second race, but once he did, the speed was there. Everts is really starting to become one of the big players in this class. And also Tal- Talvico impressed me, consistent in the sand, fast in the sand. He was really good. Kevin Horgmo, obviously fast. That guy has a lot of speed. But again, a crash. He mentioned he crashed in, in practice and hurt his neck. Had a big crash into the fence when he was leading in, in the first moto. Re-injured the neck and he, he he looked pretty sore for the rest of the day. But Horgmo would be disappointed even though he had, had decent results. Thoughts quickly on AMX too. Yeah, it was a very good race, and I thought really enjoyed it. Um, Rick Elzinger, very, very good. I wasn't sure if he'd be able to win at this level, but, you know, he's proved me wrong to win, win another moto and second overall, move into third in the championship. He did reveal to us that this could be his last year racing at this level if he can't secure a ride that will pay him in 2022. So f- fingers crossed a team will sign him because it would be mad to lose a talent like that in the paddock when he can ride like that. So fingers crossed he can secure a ride for 2022. Um, Camden McClelland actually quite impressed me because he had a shoulder injury and he was almost not going to ride, but he felt it was strong enough uh, after he'd done a moto during the week. For him to go 8-9 for, for 7th overall, I thought was very good after being very disappointed at Matterley Basin. So hopefully that can help turn his season around. Yeah, it was a it was more good race, as you said, in the MX250 and also WMX and the MX two strokes. Yeah. Racing once again, good, good in AMX. But I think that's, that's everything I really have to talk about. Thanks for listening. Please follow, subscribe. And Andy, thanks very much again for, for your thoughts. Have you a song to sing us out with? See you next week, fellow friends. Woohoo! That wasn't the song I had in mind. What song do you want me to sing? Your Jeffrey Hurlings song that you oh, carefully. Oh, oh, what was it? Jeffrey Hurlings, he does it again. Jeffrey Hurlings, he does it again. In pain. Sorry about that, everyone. Speak to you next week. Bye bye. <laughs>